everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. My name is Tracy. I'm a marketing manager with Henry Schein, and I will be your moderator for today. If at any point during the webinar you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will cover them at the end to ensure a smooth viewing experience. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large applications on your computer or mobile device are closed. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental, and no CE credits are going to be offered for this particular presentation. So our speaker today is Dr. Payman Racy, aka Dr. Payray. Dr. Yeah. Payray specializes in oral implantology and full arch reconstructions and is a coveted speaker, podcaster, photographer, educator, and a founding member of the Mold Breaking Dentistry Conference, Dental Influencer Alliance. So Dr. Payray, thanks again for being with us today. And on that note, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Tracy. Uh, thank you to you and Henry Schein for setting this up. And this is a great opportunity. Um, Andrea, who actually introduced me um, to the Henry Schein, and, and I'm glad to be actually doing this because this is my favorite topic. This is what I do every day. And I think it's something where it empowers a lot of clinicians in in a lot of ways because um, it's a full arch, um, full arch topic and it's everything in dentistry. So um, without further ado, I think we got so much to cover. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started. So just a little bit about um, what I've done in the, in the past. These are a little bit of about the organizations that I'm a member of, some of the institutions that I've um, went and finished. I uh, did some um, mentorship for Bright Array Institute, Implant Pathway, graduated COIS. I think the next slide has a little bit more. Yeah, this is more cleaner. So uh, Millennial, Dentist, uh, Millennial Dentist Podcast and DIA, uh, a couple of things that I'm, I'm very proud of, especially with the DIA and what we were able to achieve. And meet a lot of a uh, lot of interesting and and and, and amazing people. Um, the DIA. Uh, what I'm going to go over. Let me go ahead and next slide because this is going to cover what we're going to talk about today. So some of the factors that I take into account um, when I see a patient uh, that comes into my office. How would I know that this patient needs a full uh, all on four or all on X or we can save the teeth. So the first thing I'm gonna go over today is gonna to be covering how some of the things that what I'm looking at. So I'm gonna mention all those factors. Then what I'm going to do is to go over one side-by-side um, -side comparison of now that, okay, so let's say this case is gonna be all on X or full mouth. Uh, let's do this case in a digital way and an analog way. So I'm gonna go over one case, that's a case study from Tiffany, one of my Great patient. So I'm going to do that. And then at the end, again, going over the workflows between the each um, approach, the analog approach and the digital approach. The first thing, um, again, going back to this is my practice in Nashville. I built from scratch, as you can see, in 2016. In 2017, January is when I started working. This is my fourth year. Here's outside. And, uh, I'm gonna give you a quick background. You didn't need all of that. <laughs> so this is, yeah, this is my new smile uh, in Nashville. I'm close to Vanderbilt, Midtown area, um, very close to downtown as well. So um, I built a practice for general dentistry. At the beginning, I thought I'm gonna be doing general, uh, hire general dentist and do my general dentistry and I'll be doing the full arch. And that didn't really work out the way I wanted to. So what ended up happening is I had so much full arch patients and I couldn't just do general and I stopped just general altogether. We do a full mouth. Um, I do the implant. About 80% of my patients are implant related. 20% maybe extractions, denture stuff. But ultimately, the practice is an all on X type practice. Um, we, I try to make the office, as you can see, very homey for patients. Because when it comes to all on X, it, there, there's a lot of mentality, there's a lot of philosophy where you gotta make sure, let me turn this one down as well. This is a, just going over the lab part. This is this morning. I was like, let me show them what my lab looks like. So I broke down two of my operatories last year and built a lab. Um, I have a system, Zircon's on system, as well as 
ExoCAD and all kinds of toys that we're now able to make our own prosthetics um, and everything, right? The, this is the digital side versus the design center where we design things. This is the analog part. I'm gonna come back to that. This is where um, I'm going to the other room. This is the 3D printing room with the milling center. So I, I mill stuff and we 3D printing stuff in this room. I also have three, uh, about four 3D printers. This is the Photon, this is a Sega and Moonray. Um, I know Henry Sean sells uh, Form Labs, which is another great option that is a little bit low budget, four or $5,000 maybe. Here are my pucks. This is actually the analog uh, department or the re removable department where it's kind of the dirty side where I put, um, we make dentures and we do the analog route in this room. So a little bit about when it comes to full arch, the, one of the things that's important is the team. It's the number one, uh, like the most important part about all on X, anything is really having, is me being silly right there. But I, um, we, we have a lot of fun. I, I can't do anything uh, without my team, especially when it comes to the type of, when you're doing the implant surgery and you're doing the pros and you're doing the sedation, and you're doing the lab, you're doing everything in the office. This is my uh, team um, right after COVID, we came back, they made a mask and they tried, I got surprised. They wanted to surprise me with their mask. So I'm looking at it, I'm like, <laughs> that's still funny. But yeah, I was looking at them. They, they took my picture, made a mask and I, I'm looking at them, it's pretty weird. But again, coming back to the team, it is so, oh, it's the number one mode. Again, everything comes to the team, the culture of the office, and it's the leadership. You have to make everybody accountable and you have to have frontline leaders for every department from the telephone conversation. When I do my all on X courses here at the office, and I'll go over that a little bit in the end, um, there's so much stuff that we cover. And part of it is really my team that they teach the other team members that they come to the office in Nashville where they present, um, what is my marketing? How do I find patients? I get that question every day on Instagram and, and, and social media. I, I tell everybody that asks me, I'm like, I make it where I don't have to worry about how patients find me. Um, they, they have to, um, I mean, they are finding me. I don't have to find them is the, the, the real answer. We have a lot of fun. Again, ultimately, when it comes to the, culture of the practice that's number one um thing that is a lot of times being missed especially with the younger dentists i want to do in these all on x cases where they you got to tell patients everything ahead of time so i'm going to go over some of those things um in a little bit when i go over the factors um this is a good movie i watched this last week it's amazing because i'm not even a barcelona fan i don't know how many soccer fans are here or a football fan in europe they call it the uh, reason i post this is because you learn so much by watching some of these leaders especially in the field of either sports like last dance i don't know if you guys watched that but that was another amazing documentary about sports but the way that these leaders um do their job like especially Pep Guardiola this is the coach that uh, he played for Barcelona one of the best midfielder and then he later joined them and he in about in the span of three years he was able to achieve 14 trophies and that movie was just re recently released I think a few weeks ago on Netflix and it shows the way that he's talking with his team and 10 years later from what this all this happened and all the trophies that were collected and he still all these players come back and talk about how he influenced them as a person, not just really a player, but the, 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 the way that he talked and the way that he made him the discipline and everything. And that's what I honestly try to do every day. Looking at these, reading these, I have another one that's coming up. This is the why, because ultimately you have to know what is the really the reason, what are we trying to do with these, uh, with our office? There are so many patient, uh, doctors that ask me, okay, how do I start the all on X? It's so much more than, you just learn the clinical aspect of things and, and, and forgetting about it's really more than just a clinical part. It's the why. Um, is it shiny? Is it like what exactly is the full arch does for you that you want to start doing this? For me, ultimately, the why for me is um, coming down to 
this next slide, which is this. I see I, when I got out of school, graduated, I worked in a denture practice where I would see patients like that every day. And then in a matter of a couple hours, we would extract their teeth and give them a denture and their just life changed. But then try to put implants and, and give them some same day teeth. That's the whole another story. So to me, ultimately, what I'm trying to do is to give these people a hope, give them another reason that they want to. They, I mean, look at that. Just and you see these daily in your offices, and maybe not as bad as some of these cases go. But ultimately, it comes down to giving hope to these patients to smile again, to have a life. There's so many stories from every one of those patients that the reason that they lost their teeth and you, then the last thing you want to do is to ju judge them. Um, the number one reason again for me is to give them hope. That is my why. So going next to how do I now, let's say, let's say I got the patients. How do I know that these people are going to be um, all on X or do we want to save the teeth or whatnot? So these are the factors that are important, I think, and every one of them. So the first one is patient specifics. What that means is that if the patient presents with you so much infection, the anatomical landmarks, you got patients that they have sinuses that are so anteriorly placed that you can't really do all on X. And if you do, you're not going to be able to have good AP spread in the back. So ultimately, patient specific um, factors are very important when you want to do save the teeth or to let them go. This slide is mostly about do we want to save things or do we want to just um, start from scratch? Medical factors is another one, especially diabetic patients, patients who are on bisphosphonates, broxers, non-broxers, sleep apnea patients. A um, ton of these people, when they get done with their cases, I introduce the night guard. <laughs> they have to wear night guard. With every full arch cases, that's a must to protect all the glass and porcelain, and there's no problem with that. But again, the medical factors are, are, are a thing to think about before your treatment plan anybody for all on X um, versus saving their teeth. Next uh, is the expectations from both parties. Uh, and that means if the, like you gotta tell the patients if they're doing this or gonna go through this, what is their time frame? What are you gonna be able to do? What's their uh, individual appointment? How many appointments they're gonna go through? Um, right now we are on the verge of like having patients even from out of town. So when, I, when they come in, I, I got to know, okay, I'm doing this on Wednesday. They're coming in Thursday. We're going to do the surgery. So Friday, they're going to be gone. So those two, three days, we're going to do this. Then when they're going to come back for the post-op. So all of those things are predetermined from, um, from consult that they do with my front office person. Um, and then also you got to know about, um, why did it take them so long to be wanting to do this? You got to let in a little bit about their background. What is it? that makes them want to go through this um, all on X or why did it take them so long just to kind of um, get in and know more about the, your patient. The next is the financial factors and how quickly your patient is wanting to go through this. The number one thing that a lot of people compare to when it comes to an all on X treatment is, oh, doc, this is like a price of a car. And I'm like, it actually, it, it should be, it should be even more. Because if it's a price of a car, how often do you drive your car? How much of the day do you spend in your car? This is your mouth. This is your life. Did you spend 24 hours? It's in your, your speech, in your personality. The shape of the teeth talks so much about you. There's so much more to it than then talk about those financial factors and make it aware, raise awareness for why are they going through this? I usually bring my patients back to the lab and I show them, I'm like, this is what I do and this is what we do. And then they, most of the time, they see what goes on creating these smiles. So ultimately, it is a lot of uh, financial factors and patient readiness. Before you see the patient in your chair, they need to know a little bit about what you're going to about to do or you're going to be about to introduce is going to be a little bit more expensive than they probably have thought about. So those are things that need to be discussed in the consult or even before patients come to your practice, which is my case. I, I don't. I want patients to not waste their time coming into my appointment and, and all of the scheduling and everything that goes with um, creating a new patient experience. But then, then later on realize, oh my God, I don't even know that's how much it costs because that is should be done on the phone in the before they even come to the office. So those are important when it comes to finances. Emotional factors is the next thing. Um, 
you're taking things out of their mouth that God gave them and you're putting a bunch of screws and you're asking them to give you 30,000, 40,000, whatever amount of money you want to charge. It's emotional. It is um, to lose teeth psychologically. I mean, it's you, it, it, we're trying to recreate nature. That's what I try to tell them. It's that it is emotional. I'm with you in this journey. There's a lot of lingo and vocabulary and terminology you, you got to be able to use in order to calm patients down, to be able to know that these patients have somebody, especially throughout this journey that they're going to take from being a, with the teeth and then you're going to take them all out and give them teeth. So it's, it's a process. It is a process. And the only way for these people to feel calm and comfortable is when they know that you're going to take care of them. And the way you're going to take care of them is comes from what? From the patient calling the office. That's the starting point. Because if you don't have a right person in the front, then that whole experience is already going to be questionable when they walk in. So ultimately, that's why when I go back to the beginning of slides where I talk about team, they, everybody here knows I'll, I'll be nothing without my team. And it's not really even trying to brag or do anything. It's just I worked so hard with to create that type of um, team culture that it is not easily given. So that's something you got to definitely work on because that comes to help you when you emotionally try to tell these patients what they need because well, my, my team really does all of that. Next is doctor's comfort zone. When it comes to um, how comfortable you feel about doing these surgeries, communication with the referrals. If you're going to do this with uh, other doctors, if it's a if it's a, a harder case that is your first one you want to do, you probably should just refer that and go and shadow that doctor that you're going to refer to. Be like, hey, I want to do this with you. Um, this is my patient, but I really want to watch this. I do that a lot for my general dentist friends here in Nashville that they send patients. And I'm like, okay, let's go over it. So I kind of show them the treatment planning and all that phase. And I want that doctor to be involved because I want them to see what's going on. The next is the doctor's expertise. I think that's pretty much what I covered. Um, the surgery versus pros. Those are the things. How many are you going to do the surgery? You're going to do the pros as well. Who's making the lab? Who's making the teeth? What's going to happen? All of that stuff are important. And then sedation and number of appointments. Again, I went, I'll go back to that. So let's not talk too much about this. Again, this is something we can go on and on, but ultimately you're going to make sure that um, how comfortable you make these patients feel. You take the fear out with sedation and you financially create a way for them to be able to pay for these from third party finances and, and whatnot. Um, now let's get these factors that I just introduced into some of these real patients that I have, because I think ultimately you just learned with, instead of just all that, well, whatever I wrote, let's just look at some of the cases. These are, again, what are you going to do with that? It's just, there's nothing. So you need to do implants and and hopefully get them same day. This is actually a couple of weeks ago, patient. Um, these are the cases I'm gonna go over. Let's start with Jeff. So Jeff came in, he didn't wanna lose any more teeth. Again, this is, goes back to the communication you're gonna have with patients. Hey, Jeff, this is, uh, he came in, he doesn't wanna lose any more teeth. Um, this is the tooth that needs to go, number nine. It's already very close to the bone. There's no point of saving this. And, and he's missing canine, of course. He's missing, missing these teeth. He doesn't show any teeth. But again, why would I want to extract everything and give him implants? So I present two options. Jeff, you got, we can save your teeth. You're not going to get your teeth all same day because I'm going over, I'm trying to do singles. So when you do singles and not do uh, connecting all the way to the other side, you're not going to be able to load implants. It's going to be risky. You don't want to do that. So again, patient does not mind the process taking long. So what do we do? We save the teeth. And that's pretty much what it looks like when you put in few implants. I don't have the post-op final x-ray, but you can kind of see I put in um, all crowns on the top, three overlays around number, let me kind of bring them in. These three got overlays, um, just crown on top of them without really much the reduction. Then implant, implant crown, 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 and then just build up the video in a way that he's going to be able to show his teeth. He's loving it. And, and again, he didn't have to go and pull all his teeth out. Um, Miss LaDonna, this is another patient that came in. There's no problem with the time. So we're going to be able to save all these teeth, introduce a few implants here and there. And this is her Facebook photo that she took selfie and she sent it to us. And because I haven't able to really took the, take the finals, but Again, crown everything on top. There's no need to take these teeth out and just give them um, implants. Next patient, Faith. This is the one that patient comes in 
and um, has no timeline, wants to fix the teeth in this way possible. So there's, I think, everything you can think of in the dental disciplines I did on this case. Um, we did, started with ortho, we did crown lengthening to uh, make the teeth a little bit longer. We did some sinus grafting and extractions in the back um, that needed some teeth that needed to go. We placed eight implants and about 24 crowns and, and four veneers in the front. So we were able to give her a beautiful smile again, single teeth. Um, the x-rays on the, on the top, and then that was the before. And this patient, I mean, there's not much. If you look at it, there's really not much you could do. Um, the canines are gone. That's one of the main thing for me. When the canines go and you got laterals and then the margins are open, you got missing posterior, there's no question about my mind that he doesn't want to, I mean, you can't really do anything other than just all on four. So we did, this case actually was one of our patient for um, all on X course that we were able to transform his life in one day, top and bottom. I believe this was October of last year. Um, yeah, we were able to give him a before and after. There's a photo. This is Jay, he was already dentulous. I think he took his teeth out or he just had extraction from another office and he's like, I can't do dentures. So he came in and we were able to, again, change his life and be able to give him a same day smile. And that's the selfie he just took um, and sent it to us. So analog versus digital. This is where I go to the second part of my discussion. So the first part was, let's talk about how are we going to get these patients in the room and, and be able to work that team collaboration, have that culture, and, and introducing this all on X option and what do we have to do for that. But then the main topic for today is really this, and that is analog versus digital. What are we going to do? I think everybody now is um, wondering what all the things that goes on in the digital world in the full arch and the analog. So my journey from analog to digital is still ongoing. It's never gonna stop because there's so much things that you learn from analog from school days, from courses you go to, and then you see these gadgets that they come up with these toys that makes your life so much easier. So then you keep kind of going to that learning curve and that's a steep learning curve which I'm going to go over. Here's, I, I, just, I posted this slide. It's the literature that shows there's not too many literature covering the analog versus digital because if you think about it, it's very difficult. As many as all the uh, different branding and companies that are out there, to make a very good scientific research about what's best. But if you can see, both of these um, reports and the research clinical studies that I found they are both cover the fact that the digital is much more perceived better for the patient and their acceptance, case acceptance goes higher. And that's another reason for digital being better. But um, ultimately, when you go over analog versus digital, they both have to be prosthetically driven and should deliver the same end result. You should not say, oh, I don't have this machine, so then your teeth are not gonna look good. Oh, the only difference is really for you as a doctor or clinician is how fast and accurate you want to get there. So what I try to do is to make all of the analog and digital flow workflow uh, simple. And I'm really proud of this because me and Shane, uh, Shane, my um, technician, he actually helped me to put this together too. And what we try to do is to make it as simple as possible by three main steps, capturing, planning and designing and manufacturing. Those are the main three steps that I'm going to go over more in detail. So let's look at analog workflow. If you think about analog, some of the pros and cons, it, analog has always been around. I mean, you, it's, you can hold the physical model, you have articulator, you can see things. Um, it's much more simpler, especially for me at the beginning where I'm like, man, I, when I see the things on the computer, you can't measure. And, and, it's, and I show you how you can actually measure those still. But it's hard. Um, I love retracing your work back. If something didn't fit or didn't work, you know exactly. You have a model. You go back to the model. Okay, this is the problem. Um, the the pros is also it's cheaper uh, probably. Um, the cons it takes time. Uh, it takes longer. The aesthetics and durability again questionable compared to milled stuff. And you mill things is definitely stronger and then patients can't really see what you're doing designing they have gag problems and all that stuff to so where it's so much easier to when you use the digital scan don't worry about the right side that's the capture the plan design i'm going to go over all of these so let's talk about now the digital workflow pros and cons 
for digital, you have fewer steps, as you all already know. It takes fewer materials, um, less time consuming, and records can be saved. I think all of you guys, whoever have the intraoral scan, know that you can say that is scan the patient's um, teeth. I have patients from like three years ago that they're like, oh, I wish that I could go back to those. So I'm like, okay, let's bring that scan up and look at it. Imagine if you had analog or cast. The emotional dentistry part where a patient can see their face or their teeth in a computer. Are you kidding me? That's the best way of co-diagnosis. Frank Spear has a book um, called for the case acceptance. And I always love that co-diagnosis model because um, when it comes digital, I love to show them what it looks like. And then I want patients to look at it and be like, okay, yeah, they're involved with it. They, they are, the case acceptance is much more higher. And again, you can also be completely modelless. Some of the cons of digital is the startup cost, of course, the technique sensitivity. You definitely want to have a technician. You, it's a steep learning curve. I get a lot of people that they want to get their assistant in between patient and then start training their assistant to be their printer girl, like 3D printing stuff. And it's like the workflow don't work. You have to have some time. You have to delegate and be able to train them, train your team uh, to be able to do the 3D printing for you or even milling. Or if don't, my, 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 um, when I first started thinking about owning a lab, I was very, very um, clueless. I'm still, am, but I was very clueless about how am I going to, I was thinking one of my best uh, assistants, I'm like, I'm going to train her, but it's very difficult. So, and it's not too many technicians around that be able to help you. So you got to be very, very careful in terms of when you invest into uh, those expensive machines, the inconsistent support. That's another thing that you may experience when you deal with, some of the some of the things you get so here is a case study tiffany tiffany came to us um for she came in she was like i don't like my teeth i keep they keep breaking and i want to get rid of everything and i was like first well hold on let's look at things in in more detail so she came in these are the pictures that i took and we took from the beginning there are the, more pictures here that um from side so you could see that this is a very challenging case um, and the way that I'm going to go over all of this, so this is a case where I'm going to cover the digital side and I'm going to do the analog side. So you can kind of understand both what takes on, on each, on each one of those. So let's go to, I think next slide is the x-ray. Okay. So again, patient came in, she wanted to just take everything out. That was her first thing. I was like, nope. I'm always, I love saving teeth. As much as everybody sees my Instagram, they think that I'm an extractor. I love saving teeth if you can, depending on how many appointments, again, going over how many appointments it's going to take, how many visits, how many numbing, how many gel you got to inject and, and, and numb them. So she came in and I, I was like, well, we could do crown lengthening. Um, I think uh, the options were, yeah, crown lengthening, we, we do single implants in the back, start building those. We have to do, and then the other option was, let's just take them out and start from fresh with facial plastic. Because if you look on the next slide, there is an existing implant there. And that's what is making everything very difficult. Um, when she's uh, smiling, she's showing too much gum and teeth and the te teeth need to go. Everything needs to just be moved up. So in a way, to me, with that implant being placed, it made the case a lot harder than it needed to be. So the treatment plan for us now at this point is let's take everything out and start um, because we have to take that implant out. And the reason for taking that implant out is if I keep that implant, I have to make everything parallel to that implant. So even after all of the things we do, she's still going to be showing that gummy smile, which is not ideal. So that's, the, that's where we're going to actually show you the surgery and everything for this case. Again, going back to analog and workflow, digital workflow, both follow the same steps, capturing, planning, design, and manufacturing. Let's start with the analog. Mixing alginate impression material and taking impression of the patient. So that's the first step. When we take impression of patients, you could either do, I think everybody here knows how to take you know, alginate impression from patients, but I post this because I wanted to show the people who have intraoral scan, you could still do your intraoral scan and then your your assistant or your technician can go and make a model. That's not the best model, honestly. I just told you just going fast to do it. But you could see that in here, we have the actual um, intraoral scan that we printed. And then you can actually duplicate it, which I'll show later. 
The capturing phase for analog also takes a phase bow. I use a Koi Spatial Analyzer that gives me the best ideal uh, internal relationship with the ear and everything that makes it super simple for my technician to start setting up teeth. As you can see, that deviation in the nose makes it where you can put the middle of the front teeth uh, in the center. And what happens is this plate right here becomes my technician's first. So this tray gets sent to my technician and she'll be able to set teeth according to how this is set in, in, in the patient's face. So that's a very important tool. And I'll show you how I can do this in a digital route without using face bow. And that's what we're gonna cover. So you could see the analog capturing phase and now let's go to the digital capturing phase. There are two things. I think everybody here knows three shape. I think Henry Shine sells that. They sell also many more uh, intraoral scanner. I'm happy with my three shape. Um, it works great. You could see this is actually her, uh, Tiffany's mouth where we were able to play around. You could kind of see the shade matching and, 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 and different sort of thing. The next thing I want to show after you do the intraoral scan is now you have their teeth, but now you need a facial scan. This is where things become so much better, faster, easier for lab technicians. They all love this because you can capture face of a patient where we have this um, Zirkin's on face hunter, we call it. It's a face hunter and plain analyzer. So that face flow that I just showed you, it becomes, uh, you can actually get that digitally with the face of the patient and allow you and your technician to see things in a, in a 3D manner where you can actually set up teeth and, and different things. So you can close their teeth and, and I'll show you more of that here in a second. I think I have the actual, yeah, this is what it looks like. It's a laptop that connects. This is the, the face hunter. Now that we've done the capturing phase, we need to plan and design things. So let's go to analog again. So I keep going back and forth because I want people to not get confused of what you do here. On the left, you can see that I have plan and design. And then on the right, we're gonna go over that after this, that's the digital. So for the analog, after you capture things, then you have to create the models, which is pretty simple. Again, you just pour up, cast. I'm not gonna really go too crazy at this. I don't wanna bore you guys with how to pour up, cast and models. But you can see on the right, we have a 3D printed model where it's so much more faster and accurate. I think later to this video, I think we have a, actually a comparison side by side. You can see there's so many errors that you're gonna be able, you're gonna introduce when you pour up stuff. Um, with 3D printing is much faster, much better. So I think that is number one thing that is very important for, if you have an intraoral scanner, you got to get a 3D printer and start learning how to print models. Next, let's go over. Um, so yeah, get the models. And of course, you're going to have to mark and articulate it and mount it. The reason I'm posting this and showing you guys this is because I want to take this back to the digital. I know you guys know this and how things are mounted, but I, the thing I wanna show is mostly how it compares to the digital route. Once you mount the model, this is where we have, uh, so this is a mounted model for Tiffany. You can see how this is how she comes, and she um, bites down. You could always open her up with a little bit of leaf gauge. I'm moving everything up again in her mouth. I have the picture, my technician has, um, so you could see in the analog route, we're drawing the tooth, the size of the tooth. What are we going to do? Um, what is the hair size? Because you don't want to take hair from what hair she's wearing to something different. You always want to be consistent with the temporary. All we're doing really here is setting up teeth and prosthetic, making a temporary. And we're looking at the facial plastic. You could see how much that protrusion is. It's almost like, again, orthognathic surgery. Once we get the actual planning, then you have the teeth. You can select teeth, different size teeth you want to use, depending on, again, your style, um, what you want to use. There are different denture teeth that you have. And it's cool because you have these denture teeth. You can look at them, measure them, whatnot. Then when you go to digital, you have libraries. Then these libraries come in pretty much drag and drop. Um, pretty simple. Once we got those teeth designed, then we got to have to cut the cast where we want to do that line that came in from my pre-planning. This lecture or this webinar doesn't cover how I'm going to plan this. This is mostly about comparison about digital versus analog. 
if you guys really want to learn all of this, it's a weekend course. I usually do a two day course where um, I'll show you that more later that we cover all of this stuff, which is not even enough in two days, let alone trying to cover it in an hour. Um, again, extraction, bone reduction. So now these teeth are ready. Uh, the cast is ready for us to set up teeth. This is where my technician is working, waxing it up, waxing up. So again, going back to, let me see if I can pause it. I'm going to this. This is that face bow. So the face bow goes from the patient's mouth to my technician's hand. And she's going to be able to look at that blue line or black line. And that's where the, the, the old teeth of that patient was. So now we're going to move it back, push it back and, and so forth. So it's it's um, important to have a nice workflow for analog and digital. Mm -hmm. And your technicians need to feel comfortable. And I, I work with my technicians daily. Uh, I almost live in the lab more than I actually see patients these days. But it's important because it shows me a lot of things that I didn't know as a clinician. Okay, so now that we did the designing stuff in the analog world, let's take it to the digital. So now let's see how this compares. So once you export and get all of those intraoral scan, you have to bring it in into the software that you use. What kind of software you use? You could use ExoCAD, you could use Trios, you could use um, Zirconzon, Modelier. There's so many programs. You could see the articulator that I have. You can choose the articulator. You wanna use Panadent, you could use Panadent. If you wanna use Avoclar, you could use Avoclar, Whipmix, whatever you wanna use. Then I start bringing patient's face in. And you could see I have the patient's face in front of me. So when I'm designing this, it's just like going back to how my, um, analog technician had um, articulating in front of them. I have the patient's face in a digital world. So yeah, I could kind of tell you how quickly uh, we were able to see things in a bigger, uh, bigger picture. So this is how you can measure things. There's so many little tricks you could use in a digital world. But again, going back to the cons of digital is that who knows how to use this? Who is going to help you to build this? So right now, this is the problem where a lot of people, and you could, again, look at this, you can use the articulator, even in a virtual mode, it's called virtual articulator. And you could use those protrusion movements, excursive movements, and, 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 and those sort of things. So it's very amazing how far the technology has come in terms of the digital dentistry. The designing model. So once we actually have those um, in the face and the patients and everything there, there are two things you could do, either model less, you could design it and just go to mill, or you could actually design the models, as you could see in the ExoCAD, and have articulators. You could kind of create your own articulator. This is a very cool, neat looking articulator. And once my um, model is made, then we'll go back later on. I'll show you how this is 3D printed and, and so forth. So now that we designed the models, I showed you how we extracted their tooth on the cast. I want to show you how we extracted their teeth on the computer. You just pretty much click delete. <laughs> but also, you, of course, you want to go around and see how much you want to reduce. Again, this course is not about how much I reduced. It's more about how I do it. It's li literally, you got to go around each tooth and then just kind of take them out and then fill the gap and slowly start building teeth and, and so forth. For this case, this just shows the teeth being extracted. You can see that filled a hole, but I took a lot more bone than what that looks like. It just kind of gives you the idea of how virtually extraction has been done. Once you take the teeth out, now you have the teeth um, or the new library of the teeth. What are you going to use? And the cool thing about digital is for any technicians that are seeing this is Look at the possibilities. You could just have the old patient's face, now your patient's face, and you can bring in teeth, whatever you want to do, scale them bigger, scale them smaller, move them midline here and there, and think about how quickly that could be achieved versus going back to the analog routes of moving teeth. When you do a reset for a denture tech, they're going to be like, what did you punch you? Because now, look at how quickly you could do that in the digital world. Boom, and you have library of different set of teeth and, and bring in different libraries and so forth. This is um, where you could do um, guided. This presentation really doesn't cover guides. Um, I think my good friend is going to cover that later on, uh, Dr. Sonata. But this is a perfect opportunity to see that you could actually bring in the models and, and superimpose it to the DICOM X-ray. I use Lab Pronto from Blue Sky Bio, which is a free software. And we use that in order to get um, 
the guides made. Some of the cases I do guided, but most of the cases are freehand. Again, going back to the comparison. So we did the plan and design in both steps. Let's now go ahead and finish and process in the analog world. Another day, another dollar. <laughs> I took this from my technician's Instagram. She was posting this on her page. But you could see that I have the hydrocolloid machine and we have the, we use a poor acrylic technique when we do the analog, um, analog way. So you could see that this teeth come out and then the denture comes out and you just have to, I think I have a model of it here. Pretty much like this. You can see these are sprues in the back. You have to kind of cut these and in order to kind of finish it and cleaning it up. And again, once it gets cleaned, shine it up and, and polish it and that's ready to be delivered as far as the immediate interim where I'm going to convert this denture to a fixed and I'll show that later. Um, so now let's take that manufacturing to the digital. What do we do first? So there's CAD CAM, which again, we did the CAD already software. This is a nesting. What's nesting is that you're going to give the milling machine the algorithm of what do you want to mill. So all the implant positions, this is another case where we are doing the temporary for a patient. I just thought that it would be interesting to see it. And once it gets milled in a puck, you can kind of position it. This is a PMMA puck. So um, you can have the supports, you can reduce the supports and, and et cetera. Once it gets milled, this is what it looks like. So I have a computer in my milling where it shows when my mill is actually cutting things. You could kind of see I screen recorded this, but here's a puck. There are different pucks that we have with the PMMA. You could do metal where I do my bars using um, the same milling machine because my milling does the heavy wet metal. And again, it's awesome to have that milling machine to show what it's doing. Here's what it looks like. Once you get it milled, then I'll show you what happens later. But this is the 3D printing. So you could say, send that same design in the model year or software that you use ExoCAD into your 3D printer. So a lot of people, a lot of folks right now don't really need a mill. They could just get a very nice printer and, um, and be able to 3D print things. I have a Sega and I have, I mean, that's $12,000 right there. And then I have a $250 printer as well. It's called Photon. And that's, uh, it just does my gingiva and it just works just fine. And this is a process where when a technician gets it out and this is being printed, you got to cut it and then cut the support. And then you rinse it in alcohol, isopropyl alcohol, and, you, and then you cure it. Once you get cured, it's ready to be rolled. And then go next. So again, here's the zirconia that we got. Once again, once it comes out of the um, meal, you see my technician is putting in the, the, skill, the art in there, pretty much making the intraproximal different. If you see these videos, I honestly post, it, post these daily on my Instagram. If you guys want to learn more about this stuff, just follow me on Instagram, see the daily stories, because honestly, I took most of these videos from the videos I have already posted before. Once we get the meal, um, once we get the milled zirconia colored, then we place it in the sintering oven because it needs to be sintered. This is 20% bigger than what needs to have, what needs to be in the patient's mouth. When it gets reduced and shrunk, once you uh, crystallize it in that oven in almost temperatures of about 1600. So I use uh, Pritao Select. It takes about 12 hours for it to, to work. Then after 12 hours, you are able to get it out and then do the, uh, I think I, I have it here where I'll show what I'm doing afterwards. And it comes out, you do some, uh, what you saw at the beginning was color liquids. You just make the gum look different because they're both the same. So you just make the color gum a little different and then the teeth different. And you put in the sintering. Once it comes out, you have to stain it and glaze it. 
And those are the things that are done after you can see on the left. This is a PMMA that my technician is putting the com co composite. So on PMMA, you use things like resin and you cure them like you see. On zirconia, you have to use like pink porcelain or regular porcelain to layer it. If you're doing any cutbacks on the porcelain, but it's cool. It's fascinating. I love seeing it. And if you look on the left, this is actually a temporary for a patient. It's hard when you put it in patient's mouth, then imagine what they expect to do for the final with some of these. It just makes your work harder. I always tell my technician, please do not spend time on your temps. Make him uh, not, not perfect for sure. It's hard to please patients afterwards. So this is, again, going now to the surgery, Tiffany, because I think you guys need to see the surgery. What happened is I take my pictures from um, my Nikon D810. You want to see more about my photography setup, then go to my page, drperry.com. You can see the photography setup. I have a video on how I got my lens set up, my all that flash thing. So this is the surgery where I'm using that mousse record. This kind of shows the initial position of how her teeth are. I could always keep that. That's like my guide. I'm using this suck down bone reduction guide in order to um, find out where my bone reduction needs to be. So I have that on the model and I transfer that with the suck down to the patient's surgery, where as you can see, I'm just raising the flap right now, reflecting that flap and showing what I'm about to do is really doing the bone reduction, extraction and implant placement. So this is the initial alveolectomy we're using. I'm doing facial reduction and I'm doing uh, vertical reduction on her, um, we're taking some teeth out, putting that again, putting that suck down reduction guide in there. If you're doing a guided, then by all means it's easier, but this is just some way that I, again, I don't use guides, but there's so many different tools and gadgets that you could do in order to make your work easier. So um, I'm doing a little bit of facial plasty, doing a recontouring on that same case. Again, I'm pushing all of that gingiva or a bone back where it needs to go um, using a pilot drill and start placing my implants. I use Neodent these days for full arch. Very happy with it, with, uh, with the multi-units. We're taking that implant out again, as you can see, it was, uh, and then placing our implants, Neodent Aquas and the multi-units. Once we finish putting the multi units, this is again the, another implant. Let me see if I can definitely achieve the 30, 40 centimeter for each implant. I tried the denture that we made for the patient in always, I use that in the middle of the surgery to make sure we're on the right path. You can see, I mean, if I need to reduce more, I could always do that there. I use a bone profiler before I place my multi units because I want to make sure that I get a nice contact. And here's my um, multi-units being placed. There's a patient biting down on the um, healing caps. Um, next, I'm going to cover the denture conversion. And like you can see how much tissue I had to reduce. So the denture conversion, I think we don't really have much time to cover this right now. I don't want to go over it, but you could always look inside. Um, I put the blue mousse first, make her come down. I use the acrylic, a rebased Tokoyama material. And this is a very completely different approach than the traditional pickup. And I just get this picked up very quickly. And, and it, as little as about 20, 30 minutes, I can convert a denture and make it fixed. I do it myself. I, I train my technicians now that my technicians do it. And this is how it looks like. Converted denture R2F. If you want to learn more about it, I have, um, think, and so this is the kit, denture conversions. I They are available on my website, drpayer.com slash R2F. This is a good friend of mine, Brandon. He's a prosthodontist. He came up with it, and, and I, love, I love using it. I've been using it last, since last year, and I love it. This is the denture converted that same day of surgery for Tiffany. And um, let's see, this is, uh, I post-op, you see it, she's healing 
Excellent. Here are the access holes from the R2F. And this is Tiffany before. And here's new Tiffany. I still think that we could still make the teeth a little bit larger. And that's what we're going to do later on. But I mean, she's very happy. She can't stop smiling. And again, going back from that gummy smile to be able to do that in the same day is amazing. Um, and again, talk about how many appointments we had to do crown lengthening and trying to make it look good. So it's amazing how we were able to, again, go from this face hunter, the pictures from the face. I use the analog method of making the teeth. But again, I have the digital as well here. Actually, it's funny. I have This is from the meal. I didn't deliver this, but I wanted to keep both because I always like to have both options available. Um, let's see. And again, going from that to her smiling, she's very happy. Now that we took the temporary, there are two, there's a couple of things I want to just go over. And I think we're going to wrap it up and ask, do the Q&A verification jig and, and creating a master impression after the implants have been placed. I go over this uh, real quickly. So I put the multi-units. This is really the steps that my technique my assistants do they make the jig they used to make the jig and make it ready for me you pretty much have to connect them all and and then create the nice one piece that they all passively get in and out and i'll go over most of these in my in our courses once you get that let me go next and we, we have the model once we take that impression here's a model of the case um this is not that patient, but just kind of gives you an idea. This model for coming from analog route. This is actually a few jigs from this past few months that we did. This is actually from June, month of June and May, June that we did this. Then we actually we were able to get um, the new, which that's the new thing I was going to talk about, is the photogrammetry or the peak that I use and tissue capture. So this is the digital way, again, going to the digital and comparing it to the analog. You saw the analog, it takes that much time to do it. The digital, I use the peak, it's called precise implant capture. It's a photogrammetry. What it means is that you have these pre-coded um, flags that is in the patient's mouth, you introduce that, then you use this nice scanner or this wall E that people call it, and you go in, and you could get the number of implants in a matter of five, 10 seconds, very quickly. And it gives you, like here, you could see that number of eight implant compared to the other implant, you have that much angle discrepancy, and there's that much distance with the other implant. Number 14 implant has eight degree, for example, with the other implant. So it gives you all those information, and it gives you the actual implant position. It does not give you the tissue, which is that's the whole, there's another philosophy behind how do you, how does a scan body don't work? When you're doing the implant position and you're taking a tissue, you're introducing a lot of variables from the capturing the implant position. That's why photogrammetry for full arch is, a, is the main approach or that's the best way to go because you're only capturing the implant position. These are the six implant position, but what we do need next is where the gum and where the pa patient's gums are. So then you can merge the two together. You could either do an intraoral scan on the left, and then you saw, or we could do an alginate of patient's um, healing cap, and then you put the two and two together in, a, in, a, in your model year or software and be able to do this um, in a very fast, very cool, and I love it. My, my assistants love it. Today, we had one case that they just did it without even me seeing the patient real quick. They just took it. I'm like, oh, because I like to do the scan myself. But again, at the end, this is my why. give hope to these patients that 
came to you for uh, again for their smile. This is what I wanted to go over. This is the ultimate all on X course that we've been doing in Nashville. In my practice, uh, they come in. I mean, we've had people from London to Miami, California. I'm very proud. We had oral surgeons, specialists, periodontists to come into the course. And we just hang out. We do two days of full arch. We do live surgery. There's another course that we did. And again, we have oral surgeons. And I love having different specialists coming in because it's a good collaboration and multidisciplinary to talk about these things. This is uh, the last video I'm going to show you. And then we're going to do our Q&A. Heavenly Times, and I am in love with the All On X course. Well, thank you so much to Henry Shine. I don't want to forget this slide. I think it's very important to thank them for creating this opportunity for all of us to um, get together and see what I'm, what I do every day in Nashville. <laughs> so I'm, I'm good, Tracy. If you have, I don't know what's going on in the Q and A, but I'm, I'm all yours. You have a couple of questions. Can you please review the hygiene recall protocol? Yes. So the hygiene, if I do for immediate load surgery, I always like to see them back in a week. Uh, we'll take our post-op 3D in a week. I don't like to put take post-op right after surgery because never really, there's so much movement. So next week uh, after surgery, a week later, I see them. Then I'll see them four months later. Sometimes I do like to see them in two months just to be able to clean it out. Um, then, um, after they're done, say, for example, once we do everything and then they would deliver, I like, I used to see patients twice a year. Now I'm seeing them about once a year. The main thing about when it comes to maintenance and hygiene, and I love this because it's so important and it's so missed. Um, it is the fact that we make these intaglio design so hard for people to clean then we get them in recall and we're like, hey, what did you clean? So it's really, really, really come down to if you create a nice cleansable surface at the intaglio or where it's touching the tissue on top or bottom and make it easy for them, the chances of you really needing these patients are very little. You don't have to do anything. I had a patient, like there are always cases that come in. One of them was from 93, 94. She hadn't had them taken out. It was crazy. And everything was working fine because there was such a big high, like there was nothing touching the gum. So she could definitely clean. But normally I like to take them in one, one year. That is good for the warranty. And also it's good because um, I could see the x-rays and take a PA, make sure everything is good. Patients always um, complain. I mean, they do give a compliment about, oh, thank you for giving us this. And it's good uh, practice field there too, because they always refer people. What material do you use for verification? So I use the GC resin. It's from Primatech. It's the best material. It has the least amount of distortion. I mean, it's the most accurate. I, again, I've done about right now, I have about thousand documented cases of full arch. And everything I'd done before that I had this PICA scanner was jigs. And I got very good at it very quickly because, and I, then I trained my staff because my assistants do a better job now. They do it and then they have the jig ready. I'll just come and check it. But yeah, I use the GC resin from Primatech. Great. Um, do you use TI or TI bases now that you're doing PIC? Tie bases, yes. So there are two ways that you can actually go direct to the multi units, but you don't want to do that for zirconia um, because you always want to have a titanium to titanium connection. But I always use, yeah, I use tiny little tie bases from multi units. You don't really want to go direct to the implant fixture. You always want to use multi units. That's the number one thing when it comes to full art. So always create enough space for you to be able to put the different heights multi-units and then um you could uh, yeah you gotta i use always tie bases with all my zirconia if i go direct it's for really temporary where i'm going for pmma I always go direct because you don't want to waste any more tie bases 
And then for the bars, when I make bars with the overlay of PMMA, then um, you don't have to really use tie bases. And I love it when I do bars because it just goes directly to the multi-units. Is the iOS captured data for the soft tissue accurate enough for merging with the implant position from PIC? Very good. Very good in question because that's the thing that I wasn't sure before. How are we going to actually capture those? The, the amount of distortion that comes from that tissue is not as significant as if you try to do a scan body or directly on top of the implant and capture the tissue as well. So when you get that, it's called divide and conquer. You're dividing the implant positions and you're having the tissue different because if you do them both at the same time, that's the problem where we have with the scan bodies. And, and that's the problem. So where you just divide it, do the implant position, and you got the six look you see for Tiffany, and then you bring the tissue from the intraoral scanner. And when I send it to my designers um, or my technician here, we have really no problem of merging it. The coolest thing about it is all of these jigs that I've created over the past years, few years, is that once I did the peak or precise implant capture, the passivity of this framework, when you put it in, it like you just, it, it's a different feeling because you're like, whoa, how cool and passive these were. There's no verification needed for these scan bodies or for this photogrammetry. How often do you change screws? The screws are, every time I take them out, Every time I take a prosthetic out, um, I like to change the screws. Um, I usually charge patients, I think 250 per arch that we take it out, we do the cleaning pretty much, and then we put them back in. The screws need to be always brand new. Um, the other thing is that I was going to cover once you asked about the screws is that you don't necessarily need to use brand new screws while you're trying to fabricate these prosthetic, meaning wax drawings and things. But ultimately, when you do deliver, you need to make sure you use brand new screws. And because they're they're not cheap, but, I mean, they're usually 15, 20 bucks a piece. So if you're doing six of them, that's 120. So every time you have to really charge patients. So the 250s that I'm doing is really covering the cost of the cleaning and then the, um, the, the screws, because ultimately it's just, yeah, 250 is not bad. How do they clean the intaglio on the upper? I always give them, um, we, before they go through this treatment, we tell them all the things they need to get. And number one thing is water pick. So I tell them grab two, three different water picks because you could keep one in the car if you want a portable. I had patients that, I mean, again, you do these more often than you got patients that come back and tell you all these crazy things that they created with their water pick. Water pick is number one. Um, and then brushing where it connects uh, the areas where it does connect to the gum. You want to use an electric toothbrush. I always tell them, use an electric toothbrush so you don't have to put so much pressure. And, and yeah, pretty straightforward. Water pick is number one. Is bone reduction always necessary? Depending on where you want the teeth to be. I think this is, again, something that I didn't really cover because I didn't have the time. But I think I had a slide talking about prosthetically driven, no matter you do digital or analog, doesn't matter what you wanna use, what toy, is where the teeth need to be in this patient's face. When I go back to Tiffany's case, the, I don't know if I have it, let me see that. Like for example, this. Okay, so when I see this, bone reduction is an absolute must because I'm having to move everything from here. I don't want these teeth to be here. I want teeth to be, I want the lower of the incisal edge to be right here almost because I don't want gum to show. So bone reduction is it a must. You always, always have to see where the teeth need to be. So what I do, I put the teeth, if I have to put them here, I put it here and then I measure 12 millimeters because that's how much you need for zirconia. In this case, that's going to be, then you go 12 millimeters up and that is going to give you your bone reduction where it needs to be because 12, 14 millimeters, that's how much you need. Again, 14 millimeters better because you're going to have two millimeter of multi-unit. And that's ultimately the reason because a lot of failures that come from full arch cases come from not enough reduction from doctors because again, they didn't know where the teeth needed to be before surgery. And that's the problem. Okay, hey, other options besides Face Hunter. Thoughts on Bella? Yeah, there is another one. Actually, I saw Fernando Polanco in Fresno, California. He's a technician that they came up with this thing called Insta Riza. And it's amazing. It's, um, I think it works even faster than my Face Hunter, honestly. But um, anything that captures face, that Bella's 3D app that some people have, that doesn't really work yet. It's a lot of work with, I mean, there's a lot of problems with it and trying to merge it with ExoCAD. So uh, we use the face hunter, Zircon Zon, um, 
but there is the one that the only one that I know is called Insta Riza.com. Um, or if you type in Fernando Polanco on, on Google or Facebook, you could see what he's, um, um, he's able to give you a demo and show you those. Cause I think honestly, that face is the game changer when it comes to digital side of things in lab. What are you using to stain the gingiva of the PMMA? Oh, what do I use? I use Creoline. There is a Creoline that I use. It's a beautiful um, or Annex, Annex Dent um, comes with it. I think I have both. There's one Creoline and then Annex Dent. And they come in different types of ethnicity, gum for gum wise. And you could kind of color. It's just like it works like composite flowable. And you make it pretty, and then you cure it. And and again, PMMA. Um, I love I love making PMMAs because that's ultimately so much stronger than dentures. Um, is Botox part of your high smile line cases? So yeah, I honestly I do Botox. Um, I do Botox probably on just my assistants and my mom, <laughs> but uh, I don't really try to push that because. I, I need to be able to make this as nice as possible intraorally in the mouth. So sometimes that I do think about cases that maybe Botox will help. I don't know. I don't, just the fact that are you going to be like telling the patient, hey, I'm going to do this, but guess what? For the next four, every, for the forever, you're going to have to do this every four or five months. So I just, that, just that whole dialogue about it, I, it makes me think twice. So I try to make things and, and then um, in the mouth, perfect. But then I also tell patients that this is also another option. And if as long as you're cool with it, then we can definitely go that route. They just want you to comment on the cost and investment comparison and return on investment for your closed system mills and other technologies. Yeah, that's a problem. Again, going back to the cons of the milling, that's another thing I should have probably put that closed system. Um, I think the way that things are moving forward with the digital world there is that closed system is really old school. That's they're gonna suffer. Um, I don't want to really. I mean, Serac did that in the '90s, and guess what? They created. It was a great branding because they were able to capture a market share where they were able to get all these Serac doctors. But doing it in 2020, I think it's a little bit. Um, I don't know what to call it. It's like pre, it's like very, very premature and it's not not, uh, not a good way because ultimately you're just gonna get somebody in that competition. They're gonna go somewhere else. So yeah, the meal you definitely, definitely, number one thing you take from this is like, make sure when you invest into milling or 3D printing, what kind of a support are you gonna get? What kind of a puck are you gonna have to use? You have to use certain pucks or you can use whatever you wanna use. Those are the questions and things you want to be thinking about very clearly and, and get with a bunch of people that have these machines. Talk with people that other lab technicians that are using these. Don't just invest into lab. I did the horrible. I mean, when you got, I mean, in my courses, I go over this journey of going from analog to digital in the lab world. It's, it's honestly has aged me because of how much. I didn't know about lab. And that's because I, I thought I'll be able to, just because dentistry, I was good at it. And then I was like, lab, mm, I can get it. But it's so much more. And not having a lab technicians before I opened the lab was the biggest mistake I made. Um, because guess what? It's hard to find la good lab technicians that is cross-trained to do the full arch. How do you measure inter-arch space to ensure the patient is a candidate for a fixed prosthesis versus implant retained over denture? So I normally, when I, when I see the patient um, at the initial consult, if I need to, I'm now at a point where I can kind of see things a lot easier and faster. But at the beginning, what I used to do is to just print the model or pull up the cast, mount it, and then see, do you want to open this patient up? Are you going to close them? Or what are you going to, because most of the time, you're going to actually open patients up um, because they're older patients that collapse dentition. There's combination syndrome. There's so many different reasons you're doing all on X. So ultimately, you got to be able to have a way of figuring out, is this an overdenture case? Is this a fixed case? To me, you should not worry about overdenture or fixed. You should find out what can I do? What's the best thing for this patient? And what can I do in order to get there to put the teeth in the right place? But the fastest way you could do this is I think honestly comes down to at the beginning to print models or, or pour up models and then figure out if I have 12 millimeters, like say, for example, you cut the teeth, right? You cut the teeth from where on the cast. And then now you're like, okay, how many millimeter do I have? Do I need to open them? And there's a little bit more to that 
that that I can't really answer from this. Um, it, it's a little bit more complicated than that. But yeah, ultimately have a cast, look at it. Um, if I do see, for example, if a patient is a gummy smile patient, you automatically know that needs to be a lot of, of bone reduction. You don't need as much bone reduction for overdenture cases, but that shouldn't be like, oh, I'm going to give you overdenture because I don't want to take your bone off. No, overdenture, I think, should be the second option. I did more overdenture than anybody in the state of Tennessee. I was selected with Zest as a uh, KOL. So I, I did so many over danger. And, I, and now I think patients deserve something a little bit if they can afford it. And the way that you can make it affordable for them by creating that financial awareness of what can we do to make it easy. But because guess what? Who wants to take things in and out of their mouth? That's not what they were born with. So ultimately try to do fix as much as possible or get where they need to be in, in fixed dentition. Is Photon good enough for printing? Oh, yeah. Photon is a 3D printer, yes. I'm thinking about 3D printing my temps direct to MUA using iCAM 4D. Thoughts on which resin for a temp? Yeah, there's dental models. I Depending on what you want to use a good model resin. And I tell, my Shane, I tell Shane to always get a bunch of models and let's just test out things. It costs you six bucks, 10 bucks. And just print out. Um, it's a great way, especially with Arcam 4D. That's another one that is out there. I think you almost need a verification maybe for that. But ultimately, any dental model, um, uh, I use Dental 2. It's funny because I'm actually sitting in my lab. I use this dental tooth model from Asiga. You want to use a 3D printing resin or a printer, always get a 3D printer that is open. And you don't want to go and try to figure out what resin you want to use. But again, most of these 3D resins um, are about two, three, 400 bucks. And then get them and see which one works fine. But always get the ones that are at least temporary or um, something that's a strong. We're going to do the last question now, and um, afterwards, you know, we can always have Dr. Perry follow up with you. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody have more questions, that there's things that you saw in the PowerPoint or keynote that I didn't cover, or things that you do did see, you have more questions, the, one of the best ways really get to Instagram and, and either message me there on Instagram uh, or on drperry.com, like there's contacts form there. You can kind of put these things um, and if you have any questions, yeah. The last question is more about warranty. So there's been a couple of questions about that. What is your warranty? What do you give the patient? What guarantees do you give the patient and how you guarantee your work? And what do you tell the patient when they ask about the warranty? The way that I go about warranties, because I'm doing surgery and I'm doing the process and I'm doing the lab, um, I have to be very responsible for every part of that. Because if something happens, I'm not going to be blaming it on oral surgeon. I can't blame it on pros or somebody else. So warranty comes from looking at the case and seeing from the beginning. Most of the time, I don't have a set warranty for everybody because there are cases that if the patient is smoking a pack and a half a day, I don't, I'm not going to warranty that. You got to be very reasonable with your warranty and make sure that it works for you. Uh, don't work with companies that offer that for you. There are so many companies that I don't even bother. But I think what I try to do is to make it, make it reasonable. If you see something that is your fault, um, try to fix it. Five to seven years, I give warranty. I think most labs give a warranty on their appliances or the fabrication of whatever zirconia or whatever you get. Um, ultimately, again, comes down to the communication pre-op. Pre if, if something happens, this is what's going to be. If the patient comes in and asks for warranty, depending on what goes on, again, most of these, now that I have a lab, it's a little bit easier on me because I don't have to worry about sending it out or whatever. I can just do it here and, and it'll be a little bit cheaper for me. Um, but yeah, five to seven years warranty uh, and, and that's it. There's not much with it, but they, they also have to, with their warranty, what it entail, I give them a night guard and they have to wear the night guard. And when they break something, they need to bring the night guard and show me their pattern of wear. Because if they don't have the night guard and it's broken, that's the, that I, I can't warranty that. That's already, um, we put that in the warranty thing where if you don't have the night guard with you when something broken or you lost it, you got to call our office to come in and make sure that you get a new one because that is the only way that I know at nighttime because most of these patients really have a sleep apnea. A lot of them, they don't really want to worry about, they don't, they think they don't, they, so I don't really even put it on them to go and figure out and get a CPAP. I just give them a night guard. 
Um, there's other questions and we will give them to Dr. Payray. So again, thank you for your presentation today and thanks everyone for attending. You will receive a link to view the recording of today's presentation in the coming weeks um, via email. So again, on behalf of Henry Shine, thank you for attending and everyone have a great night, including you. Thank you, you. Christine. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.